Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, Australia's leading provider of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for overall satisfaction and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hello and welcome to this topic series on delivering cost-effective advice with an entrepreneurial mindset. My name is Fraser Jack and in this episode number three of five, we hear from Vince Scully from lifesherpa.com.au. Over the past few years, Vince has built an incredible business delivering cost-effective advice and is continuing on that journey. If you're thinking of how is this possible in this current environment, then you'll get a lot out of this episode as Vince walks us through his thinking. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, Fraser Jack here. We are in episode three of our five-part series, thinking about advice in the landscape from it with an entrepreneurial mindset. I'm joined by Vince Scully, and we're about to dive deep into what he's set up in his business. Vince, thank you so much for joining us. G'day, Fraser. It's great to be here. Fantastic to have you along. Now, uh, I'm, I've always been intrigued in your business and, and watching it grow from the sidelines and just been in awe of what you've been able to achieve from a, uh, you know, both an entrepreneurial mindset, but also with your background as an engineer, the construction. As, as you know, they're the worst type of clients. <laughs> worst type of clients, but, that, you know, that just means that uh, we can nerd out about the, the intricacies and in, in the advice process and the legislation. And, we, and I know then that, that you know these details and that's why you've been able to set up the business you have. Um, let's start with just a quick introduction to the business that you've set up. So Life Sherpa is a online financial advice service focused on the needs of younger people. And by younger people, I mean generally late 20s to early 40s. Um, the significance of those, that age group is really that they're going through life's three big changes, which I call coupling, nesting, and parenting. So they're starting to you know, deal with money as a couple. You know, dealing with money on your own is hard. Dealing with, this, with it as a couple is a much more difficult exercise. Um, they're nesting, so they're buying their first home. They're, they'll have more debt than they'll ever have in the rest of their life. They may have young kids. Um, they're a long way from retirement. And they've got very few assets, so they have the biggest need for protection insurance. And those two things, home loans and insurance, make up about two-thirds of all fees paid for financial advice in, in the country. Yet, as an industry, we are a profession. We're largely focused on the investment side of that equation, and many advisors are giving up the insurance bid um, to focus on the investment side. Non-super investment advice is about 14% of fees paid. So, you know, if you're looking to have a scale business, you've got to be in the, the home loan and risk business. Home loans are regulated under an entirely different regime. So we have both a financial services license and a credit license. Um, on the other end of that age group, you know, the reason I say early 40s is we didn't build a tech to deal with pre-retirees and retirees. That's obviously on our product roadmap but it does add a whole bunch of complexity. Um, and in order to service this group of people, we needed to do it more cost-effectively. So if you say that the average fee paid in the industry is um, it's $3,000 up front and three or $4,000 a year, that's not something that makes sense to a 28-year-old young couple who think we've got good jobs, how come we're not getting ahead and why can't we afford a house? Yep. Um, so we set out to solve that problem at a price that they would be prepared to pay. And going back to the original asset affordability or accessibility of advice um, research, which I think now is 2000, 
2005, 2006, like it's a long time ago. The conclusion was the consumer was prepared to pay three to five hundred dollars. And the recent advisor ratings research doesn't throw up any materially diff different answer to that. So we said, so well, how do we service this group of people at that sort of price? We concluded that there were three things, three problems we had to solve, um, and only one of those problems had been really addressed before. So the first one was to be able to find consumers when they weren't actually in the market for a product. So, you know, if you want someone who wants a home loan today or an insurance policy today, they are two of the most expensive clicks you can buy from Google. And um, so we needed to build something that would engage with this cohort outside of that cycle and be able to create a journey from the, I've got a vague problem with my money, why aren't I getting ahead and will I be okay, to leading that person through a journey and the journey concept is what led to the Sherpa analogy. Lead her on a journey from you know, struggling to thriving via sorting her budget out, getting her debts repaid, buying a first home, sorting a super, preparing for the unexpected, and setting yourself up to head over 40 years to retirement. So that was the, the first problem we had to solve, and that was really built around content and education. So our website is you know, content heavy, our client acquisition costs is spent mostly on um, engaging content and dispersing that. The second thing we needed to solve which is where a lot of the effort in the industry is spent is reducing the cost of service. And in our case, that was really a bad. Rather than trying to build tech that solved every problem, we said, well, let's focus, first of all, on a relatively homogenous group of people. So if you've got a self-managed super fund, you're not a life share of a customer. If you've got a family trust, you're not a life share of a customer. If you're retired, you're not a life share of a customer. If you run an incorporated business, you're not a life share of a customer. And so by focusing on largely PAYG, average or above average incomes, few assets, you actually can create technology that solves most of that problem. So what you do is you do all the research up front and says, well, if you're in this box, this is the answer. And so the device process then becomes the question of working out which box this person fits in. And there could be thousands of these boxes, but the answer is you solve the you solve for the answer first, and now you just have to work out which box they're in, and more importantly, lead them through that journey. And that's the third limit that we had to solve was making sure that the advisor client meeting, because you can't deliver holistic advice without a real human. You can solve portfolio allocation and management, which is what's traditionally referred to as robo advice. But you can't solve the human problem without human advice. So what we needed to do was to make sure that we kept the expensive bit, the real human advisor, for the bits where they were adding real value and let the machine prepare the advisor and the client for that meeting. So the client or member in our case comes to that meeting problem aware and solution aware. So they know they're trying to, for example, prepare for unexpected illness or accident. They know the answer to that is some form of risk product. They understand broadly what income protection is, broadly what TPD is, broadly what life is. And the advisor's job then is to guide them through the process of confirming how much they need, who they should buy from and why it matters and why that's the right answer for them. And the same goes with it investment advice or super advice, that one of our measures of success is that the client understands why it's the right answer. They don't have to know the intricate detail, but they do have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. I, you know, if you liken it back to your, your, your car analogy, that if you're going to go camping on the weekend, you probably need a four-wheel drive and you probably need a diesel. You don't have to understand how a diesel engine works to know that it's the right answer. But you have to know what it does for you that makes it the right answer. So if any of our clients have to resort to the, my advisor put me into this explanation, we failed in our job. So we need to give the member the 
the ammunition to deal with Uncle Bob at the barbecue, he says, well, why are you in that fund? I'm in some particular big super fund, and it's cheap, and so that our member has the psychological backing and knowledge to know that what they've got is actually the right answer for them, even though it may or may not be the cheapest. Now, they may or may not have the argument with Uncle Bob, but mentally they're prepared for it, and that gets rid of the buyer's remorse problem, which is the biggest cause of complaints in this industry. Yep. Now, I want to. There's so much to unpack in that, and uh, I love the way that you engineered it uh, through the through the three phases. And, and, I, and I really love the journey conversation when you were talking and saying that. It really reminded me of that the the you know the the hero's journey around every story that's ever been told. Who's the hero in the story? And and I, uh, and, and it's it's very clear to me as you even in the name and the uh, and the guide. Um, you know, as as a Sherpa, as a guide, you're not the hero of the story. The the client's the hero of their own story, and you're the um, and you're just the guide helping them make uh, a whole lot of small decisions, but mm. helping them make the decision, not you making the decision and telling them what they should be doing. You're just sort of guiding them through this process and saying there are a whole lot of micro decisions you need to make. Uh, we're not going to make every single one of them today, but um, he, you know, here, here is some information. Here is some here is a guide. Here are some thoughts and ideas. Um, you know, there, there are some decisions to be made. What do you want to do? Is that, is that how it works? Yeah, broadly. Um, I mean, obviously your Sherpa is is a guide who knows that the territory has done it before. They carry your pack to share their knowledge of the mountains with you. But ultimately it's your summit and they're there to guide you to your summit. Sometimes they carry the pack, sometimes they don't. Um, but ultimately it's your summit. You there to help you work out what climb you want to do and to get you there and back safely. Yep. Now I wanted to um, uh, touch in a little bit onto the tech side of it because obviously um, when you mentioned, you know, reducing cost to serve involves a, a little bit of technology and a lot of, um, you know, uh, obviously with you mentioned a lot about content and education prior to that and, and distributing that information and getting it to your members. And I want to talk to you about members as well mm-hmm. at some point, um, the word member versus client. Um, That's a very but important to- distinction. Yeah, it is. I'll, I'll dive into that in a minute, but I want to go through the tech build and the, and the conversation around, you know, reducing cost to serve. And um, obviously, there's a lot of options with tech, but then there needs to be a decision making process behind how and what you use and when you use it. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And there's pe- people are spending a lot of money and bandwidth in trying to solve some tech problems. You know, you might make the right decision today. And something newer in China is going to come along tomorrow. So sometimes you do have to bite the bullet. But I think the starting point is what problem am I trying to solve? And what is the best way to solve that problem? So we spend a lot of time now on the minutiae of cutting seconds or minutes off the call. So if we can better prepare a member for that call with the advisor and it takes 30 seconds off the average call. Well, that's that's $1.50 off the cost of delivering that piece of advice. And that adds up of thousands of members. So tech is important, but unless you know the problem you're trying to solve, you're never going to get the right answer. And you have to be prepared to accept that today's right answer might or might not be tomorrow's right answer. Sometimes you just have to pick and stick. So in our case, you know, we have a member-facing public-facing website, which is about engagement and education and allowing the member to diagnose their problem and prioritise the bits of it they want to solve and learn about the potential solutions as well as into their information so that when they do engage with an advisor, they are prepared for that session. So they know they're trying to solve a, a what happens if I can't work to tax and through this problem and that the solution to that problem is income protection insurance. So the discussion with the advisor now is about guiding through and through the process. Technically, we can do that untouched by human hands, but customers won't actually buy, particularly when you get to a exclusion or a, a loading. That's a huge turnoff from a, as a consumer experience. So the human advisor really is about explaining why that does or doesn't matter 
of whether they should or should not buy, notwithstanding that. Um, yep. So from a tech perspective, that website is fully custom built. It's built in Ruby for anyone who's interested in the technical details. And that's a decision that you wouldn't make today. Uh, yeah, Ruby was the hottest thing in web development when we started in 2015 or 2014. And um, it didn't really catch on outside of Eastern Europe. So if you want Ruby resources in Australia, that's a really tough ask. Yeah. So we will go through a, a rebuild of that over the next year or so. But yeah, that was a very low priority to change that decision. Uh, our tech team in the, in the Ukraine, so the recent events in the Ukraine have made that a particularly challenging exercise for release of version 4.0. So, yeah, solve what you want to do. Uh, so that's our front end, uh, client-facing product. Uh, you know, back end is built entirely on Salesforce, and that's a whole bunch of apps that all work together. So we use, we use Salesforce for our CRM, we use Marketing Cloud for our marketing automation emails and text messages. We use um, Recurly for subscription management. We use Stripe for payment, uh, pay- payment collection. We use um, a system called Vonash for our phone system so that when you dial 1300 My Sherpa, it goes, ah, that's Fraser's cell phone. Mm-hmm. Fraser's advisor is Steve. Um, now, where's Steve logged in today? And in the meantime, it started recording the call. And that recording is attached to your record in Salesforce. So for us, Salesforce was largely around making sure that all the information about the client was collected so that anyone could deal with the client's details and all of the information was there. So that yep. just that information didn't disappear as soon as the advisor moved on to another practice. Yeah. Now, I want to I ask you some information around um, the gathering or the collecting of structured data that mm-hmm. you didn't have, obviously, when you started, but now that you're, you know, several years, seven or eight years, seven or eight years now uh, into 2014, it. 2014, we got a license, so we're coming yeah. up on the page. Yeah, uh, that, that you will now have all the structured data that can help you grow you because I want to get to that in a second. Um, now, you mentioned phone calls, and obviously, that's been a big part of the business over the last few years. Uh, or since the beginning, really. Um, but how has online meetings um, come into that uh, as well? Now, obviously, there's been online meetings. And how and how have you seen that shift from, is it still most, mostly phone call or are you getting a lot of online meetings? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And that's one thing that surprised me. That's probably the biggest surprise in all of the eight-year journey, that we started by building the tech to have video meetings. So we started with Sweetbox, which you may be familiar with, um, which was advisor centric video conferencing. And in 2014, 15, 16, nobody wanted to do video calls. So we actually did 90 plus percent of our client meetings were held by far. With COVID, um, and so in the end, we actually ditched Sweetbox and replaced it with Google Meets. But through COVID, people are now actively requesting video meetings. So when you give someone a choice now, in probably more than half the occasions, they will choose video over phone. And we have COVID to thank for that. <laughs> I see that as the pendulum, right? You set it up one way, you're expecting it. Uh, it swung back the other way to 95% uh, yeah. phone calls, and now it's sort of coming back towards the middle or just over. So I mean, we're agnostic, uh, really. Um, it's obviously easier to sense whether your message is getting home and you can see the person and they can see you. You you do lose a lot of those feedback signals, non-verbal signals on the phone. So your communication skills have to be so much higher to conduct a meeting purely on the phone. And we've obviously spent a lot of time on training and processes to meet that. When you can actually see the quizzical look on a on a client, on the video conference, you get a lot more feedback as to how they're feeling and how they're receiving the message. So I'm a big fan of video conference, but it's taken yep. a pandemic to convince people. Yeah, it's because that's what it's all about. It's about uh, what consumers are, are after. Um, tell me a little bit more about um, with the video calls you mentioned, you use Google Meets mm-hmm. now and with uh, with hearing impaired people or people that uh, wouldn't be very good on the phone. Yeah, um, we've 
got a number of members who are um, hearing impaired and they are quite happy to have a two-way dialogue using video conferencing. So Google Make produces real-time subtitles or captions, which are really accurate. And you can see it going back and recreating early parts of your sentence when it works out what you've said in the rest of the sentence. And then they can, some can verbalize, others can't really. Um, and they're happy to type backwards, but they're very good at it. Um, and Google Meets just changed the game in that context. You could not do what we do with these, these group of clients without that sort of technology. Yep. Yeah, it, uh, it is certainly there's been and and in a lot of that scenarios, it's not like you've created Google Meets. It's a product that's already existing and that all you're doing is utilizing it in the, in the business. Yeah, and it's a couple of dollars per user per month. Like, yeah, um, that's such a change. Uh, when I was telling one of the BDMs, one of the fun BDMs of coffee the other day, we were talking about it, tech fun, so we were talking about technical changes in my career in um, 1983. A one megabit per second dedicated line in the UK cost a hundred thousand pounds a year. we we're just sending high definition video for free. Yep. And, yep. And that's, is incre- and that's only, incredible. Well yep. it'll be forty years next year. Um, a megabyte of IBM RAM for the three sixty was a hundred thousand dollars. Yep, and it doesn't it doesn't appear to be slowing up too much too. It's still got a fair way to go. Now, one of the things I wanted to throw into the mix here was just the conversation we mentioned earlier around membership and members, um, because a lot of the time we, we struggle with, you know, uh, the, the process, the traditional process was um, a fee for service, either linked to um, linked to an investment amount or or the time and within an office, because obviously that's how accountants used to charge per office. They used to work out what the what cost would be. So to flip that on its head and turn around and go, well, the business cost is X, Y, Z, and uh, we need X members to pay money and become members. How did that come into your head? Because you were one of the first to start doing that. Yeah, I mean, the the original thinking around that was more about the relationship between the advisor and the client. So traditionally, in most practices, most clients would consider themselves to be Fraser's client. That Fraser is my advisor. It's not Balmain Financial Advisors, what it says on the door. It's... I'm going to see Fraser and my advisor. And the consequence of that from a practice perspective was that the individual advisor started to capture more and more of the revenue and that the practice therefore really became this loose corporate of individual advisors sharing a kitchen. And that that led to a whole bunch of behaviours which were not consistent with sharing clients around the office. And it also meant that the thing that drove the advisor's ability to capture that revenue was that if they, they could threaten to walk across the road and most clients would follow them. So the initial thinking around this was that we wanted people to form a relationship with the brand, the life share of the brand, rather than their individual advisor. And the use of member rather than client is part of making sure that they feel part of the community rather than a you know, part of a book of fees that can be sold and transferred. So, but in order to do that, you've got to have a whole bunch of systems that and behaviours in the team that makes that a reality. Turning your, your $4,000 ongoing advice fee into a membership fee on its own does nothing. What you've got to do is have the the benefits of membership be clear and then to make the member feel that they are actually a member. So when you join LifeSherpa as a member, you get assigned a Sherpa who may be one of a number of people. But they could be a licensed financial advisor on the register. They could be a mortgage broker. They could be a someone who isn't on the register but is otherwise licensed. But their job is to ensure your success as a member. So they will do a lot of the coaching and onboarding to make sure that you're getting the most from your membership and to guide you to the relevant expert at the time. So if they were a 
you know, an advisor going through their PY, for example, they will have been trained in the life sugar coaching methodology and all of our philosophies so they can do a lot of the, the non-personal advice stuff. But when it comes to doing a piece of super advice or a piece of risk insurance, they would then introduce the relevant expert, but they're still fundamentally responsible for making sure that that happens and making sure that you're you're progressing as a member. And that division of labour is you know, particularly important in, in terms of the cost structure. And it but it does rely on scale. Yep. So so the, but the membership is is particular you know, is largely around divorcing that relationship between an individual and a client and turning it into a member of the community who will be serviced by whoever the relevant expert is from time to time. So when your advisor leaves, Salesforce will just ensure that all your information is still there and um, life goes on. And you still call 1300 MySherpa, you still email MySherpa at lifesherpa.com.au you don't need to know really whether it's Mary, yourself or your people. Yeah, that's a really interesting distinction, isn't it? To, to be able to have the systems in the background that can can help, but then also having a, a project manager. Um, that doesn't need to be an advisor. That can project manage the client through all the different steps and, uh, and guide them along. Now, you so, need your systems right and your processes right to make sure that that can be done in compliance. So everybody has got to understand their role in that machine yep. and know what they can and can't say, which comes down to moving compliance from that's what compliance say and that's what you do to understanding why that's the rule. So whenever we have a discussion about can I do this in our um, WIC meetings, we will always go back to, well, what does the law say? Why are you doing that? What's the section that tells you that that's what we have to do? And understand and grasp the reasons why we're doing it. And once you do that, passing the FASI exam becomes a breeze because you actually know why you're doing it. So you can yep. apply the same techniques to anything. Yep. So we bring up OSLI quite regularly in our. Uh, yes. You know, yes. Which, and this is, where, this is where we start nerding out about the legislation. Well, and I don't think it's look, actually I, nerding that it, that's what guides us as a, you know, we as an industry have obligations. If you don't know why you're doing it, it's pretty hard to be sure you're complying with it. Yep. Now, when, I want to go back to that moment in 2014 when you started the business and everybody was compliance-based and uh, best interest duty was was pretty um, the the word on, on the street at the time. It everybody was talking about best yet. interest duty and, and how it was going to happen and section G, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, you come out with a model around telephone and online advice and, and, and scaled, very well scaled, and, and to a demographic that nobody was looking at. I, I guess this comes back down to a lot of advisors when they're listening to this will go, yeah, but how are you doing your SOAs? You know, you have to do this long, lengthy document. Um, in, uh, how are you doing this over the phone? Yeah. I mean, that's the and, big uh, – uh, oh, sorry to interrupt, but that, that's, the big, that's the biggest myth in this industry and bad that you have to write a 100-page SOA. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the number one overriding requirement is that you be clear, concise, and effective. And if it's 100 pages, it almost by definition can't meet that test. So, And when you look at the requirements for what has to be in an SOA, and we would never call it an SOA in front of a member. It's just a document, documenting our advice. Legally, it has to have the word statement of advice on the front cover, but yeah, really. So when you see the FSC putting out a thing that's saying the reason advice costs $6,000 or whatever it costs is because we have to write 100-page SOAs. And by cutting out stuff from the SOA, we could miraculously cut the cost of advice. If it's costing you $3,000 to write a statement of advice as opposed to deliver the advice, I can accept it costs $6,000 to deliver the advice if you're doing it one-on-one bespoke. But if it's costing you $3,000 to write a report, you've got a serious system problem and it doesn't need to be 100 pages. One of the ways that we addressed that was by doing everything as single topics. So if someone gets a piece of super insurance, or super advice, and also does a risk piece of advice at the same time, they will actually get two statements of advice from us. And that's because that's a much more straightforward way of documenting it and automating the documentation that if you try to 
automate a complete holistic piece of advice that deals with every possible combination, you're creating a monster and it will never work. And I think that's probably the biggest tech mistake we've made as an industry is trying to solve for everything at once. Um, there's an old saying in the law that says um, hard cases make for bad law. So if you're trying to solve for all those edge cases, you end up with a monster. And that's why we focused on this cohort of the yep. demographics that if you have a broadly homogenous group, I mean, they're all different in their own way. You know, no two members are identical, but they are generally suffering from the same problems and the solutions are broadly similar. It's at the edges that they're different. So the myth of the 100-page SOA is that's simply not what the law says. There is a list of things that have to be in an SOA, and there are some peculiar mechanical things. So there's a requirement that the word SOA appear on the front cover, or the word statement of advice appear on the front cover, which potentially precludes you doing the video SOA, given that a video doesn't have a front page. Once you get over those mechanical ones, which are largely set and forget, so when you set up your document template, it's got the word statement of advice on the front cover, well, you've ticked that box for the next thousand advice that you're writing. Yes, I, 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 I love the subject, uh, Vince, on the video SOA. I think we have solved for that. I'll have to talk to you about it off, offline, but it's, uh, there's definitely a, an, an idea that the, the words SOA must uh, appear on or be near the beginning. It actually uses the word front page, um, which is interesting because I'm sure that, I mean, the, the law's not supposed to be. It, it's supposed to be tech agnostic. But these are the sort of issues that you know, when we're looking at the legislation we should be getting our legislations to, to fix. Yes, yes, we've, we've, we've done some work on it. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll talk you through it. But, yeah, you, you can certainly share a page that says SOA uh, at the front of the video and uh, it, it and it does uh, does cover. So uh, we won't get too much into that because of off topic, but I really love the concept um, uh, you mentioned before around solving for a problem. And as you just mentioned, it works really well if you've got um, understanding what demographic you're looking at. You know, you mentioned coupling and nesting and, and parenting, and they all have separate individual issues, which are then easy to solve and then easy to then fix those individual pieces on a longer term journey um, through life, rather than just trying to say, here is the all of the advice you need right now for you to fix everything today. Um, we're going to do the whole lot. And it's going to take days and weeks and, and months people and, just and get, hundreds of pages. Get decision fatigue. And yep. you can see that in, in homelands with the number of people who go 50% fixed, 50% variable, because it's the last decision they make. And you know, a lot of bank tell, of bank uh, homeland people and even brokers will go, it appears that this is the line of least resistance. Hey, you have a bet each way. It's a non-decision, so it takes away that one decision. Uh, yeah, sit on the fence. In most yeah. cases, it will be the worst of both worlds rather than the best of both worlds. But... Um, <laughs> It's an easy decision to make. So if you chop up the advice into digestible chunks, but deliver them within a holistic framework, get you really do get the best of both worlds, and the client yep. doesn't have decision fatigue. Yep. So Vince, one of the things I want—I've always loved following the journey that you've you've been on, and it's it's obviously has been a journey for the business as well. Tell us about where the business has got to now, and where what are the plans are for the future. Yeah, so so today um, we. We will do about twelve million in revenue this year, um, and that's doubled every year for the last five. Um, so we've clearly demonstrated that there is a product market fit, and um, we are progressing, and that you know, we could keep doing that. Um, the big change, the two big changes coming in the next few months is, or well, right now. So first one is we've launched our corporate offering. So for three hundred and ninety nine dollars an employer can give their employees all you can eat financial advice. That's three hundred and ninety nine dollars per employee per year, um, which is fifteenth to a twentieth of the cost average cost in the industry. So that's a bit of a game changer for us and a help the industry. That's true personal advice across home loans, insurance, super investment, with no no more to pay from the individual employee. And then the other change which is coming in the next few months is that we are moving more to an all-you-can-eat style offering. So 
as you may or may not know, our traditional model's been we've charged $150 a year. You could buy a course, you could buy a book, you could sign up for a paid webinar, you could um, buy some super advice, you could buy some um, investment advice, you could do your homework. So we had a menu of services that you could choose from. Um, we are now rolling. And the, the theory behind that was that it was clear, it was transparent, people could buy what they wanted when they wanted. As it's turned out, that adds a bit of complexity, both from a back office perspective and from a client decision perspective. So we're turning that into a, a single price of 549 a year, which would include your ongoing portfolio management and everything else that you buy, apart from upfront advice on super or investment. So that's a bit of a game changer, I think. And again, it reinforces our position as Australia's most affordable financial advice destination. Yeah, well, it certainly does. And uh, it's certainly still a fraction of the cost um, of a lot of advice practices and how they price at the moment. So, uh, Vince, thank you so much for coming and chatting us today about uh, about the business and the model and the, 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 the technology behind it. Really appreciate your input in, and being involved in the series. It's always a pleasure, Fraser. Thank you. Now, if someone wanted to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to find you or, or reach out to you? Uh, we're at lifesherpa.com.au and I'm on LinkedIn and and we are on Facebook at My Life Sherpa, as we are on Instagram, My Sherpa underscore AU at uh, Twitter. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Vince. Appreciate it. Pleasure.